Well, I'm really honored to be here. I know um, the pool of people Kim has to ask, so just even being asked is really an honor. I have to warn you guys, this is the first time I've really shared um, this part of my story in this format, so I, I have absolutely no idea what will happen. I might be fine, or there's a chance that I could be a mess, which if that's the case, then maybe some of you really empathetic people will just cry with me or embrace the unity portion <laughs> of tonight. Um, so so I, at this now, now I'm about, um, spent half of my life, more than half of my life now as a Christian. So I became a Christian when I was in high school, about, I was about 15 years old, um, which makes me 31 if you're trying to do math. Um, and I became a Christian um, after kind of watching a, a good friend of mine who was older for a while. Her, her life was um, full of joy and assurance and confidence um, and really different than anything I'd ever seen before. And I was really drawn to her and her um, and she talked a lot about Jesus, so I thought, well, I, I better learn a lot about Jesus then. Um, so I was immediately really compelled to know who he was, who God was. Um, and I can, I, I know now, I can, it's the same now as it was then. I know, I know what drew me to God, and it's the same now, was that he was uh, big and powerful and majestic and awe-inspiring. All these things really compelled me and drew me to him. And I thought, I, I don't even have a choice. I, I have to know who he is. I have to be near to him. Um, and those things really became the fabric of my faith, and they really are still still true now. I think my friends in high school would probably agree with that. They're here tonight. You could ask them. Like, probably, uh, I jumped in with both feet and then kind of looked back, being drawn to those pieces of the Lord. Um, and that's really, really remained true to my faith even now. But what I didn't realize at the time, and really even 10 years in to my walk with the Lord, um, is, that, is that though those things are true about Him, powerful and majestic and, and mighty and awe-inspiring, um, I, I, I was not at all really aware of his love for me. Um, and I would, I would say that I, would, I knew it the way you know, like, sugar's bad for you. Like, you know sugar's bad for you, but that doesn't mean you're not going to order the cake tonight. You're going to order it. I mean, you know it makes you fat. You know that it makes your body weak. You're going to get it. It tastes good. So that's kind of how I felt about God's love. Like, I knew it. It was kind of an inconsequential truth for me. Like, I knew it, but it didn't have a lot of effect on my heart. Um, you know, and as, as, as I with most things, you don't really know, you don't know something until you realize you know it. Uh, that's sort of how this was. I didn't know that I didn't, I wasn't affected by God's love um, until I got pregnant. Um, my husband and I, we moved to Seattle, we were about 26, um, and we got pregnant. Um, and we got pregnant with identical twin boys. Um, and I have to tell you, to this day, probably the most shocking uh, an exciting time of my life. Like, this is one of those moments I wish, like, I hope when we get to heaven, that God says, like, at, like there's, like, a, the DVD menu where you can pick the scene that you want to rewatch. <laughs> like, I want to rewatch us hearing the doctor say, hey, there are two babies in there. I mean, it was, like, I mean, like, like jaw, literal jaw-dropping, like, gasp. I mean, the doctor said, I'm going to give you guys a few minutes. <laughs> and she left the room for a while. Um, so I, 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 so much joy, so much joy, and so, so unexpected for us. Um, but it was a high-risk pregnancy, as a lot of when pregnancies are. And um, so I was in the doctor's office upwards of three times a week, just checking for things when they were going. Um, not getting into too much detail, especially for you guys in the room. Um, they, my boys shared the placenta, which means that they didn't get, uh, or they, they had a risk of not getting the same amount of nutrients. I think like uh, two different apartments shared a refrigerator. So one could get more and one could get less, and there's a lot of potential problems with that one being that one could have too much and, and die and one could have not enough and die. So they monitored me for this um, really often. Um, but everything was really smooth. Things were sailing right along. I was passing all of the really important weak markers um, of pregnancy, all the, the risks they were looking for kept, kept moving on. Um, and it was really going really well, apart from having to eat like an ungodly amount of protein, which is way harder than you would imagine. Um, <laughs> Uh, Sean's laughing because I had to you know, make like three smoothies a day with like four scoops of protein powder. It was disgusting. Um, but so I made it past pretty serious markers. 28 weeks, the risk of this um, real potential problem drops to almost nothing, less than 1%. Um, and all this while, Sean and I are growing in love for them and um, praying for them. I would walk up and down the neighborhood streets in, in Seattle and I would put my hands in my belly and I would pray for their lives. And I would, Ask God if there would not be a day if we didn't know him. We named them. Um, 
you know, kind of giving them names that we wanted to affirm their character. We named them Pierce, which is rock, um, it's derivative of a peer, and we named them Cohen, which is priest, the pastor, one of these lead people to Jesus. Um, and really, not a lot of um, not a lot of fear for us. Really excited and happy. Um, and at 33 weeks, I went in for uh, a Monday checkup, which is really typical for me. And everything looked awesome. Everything looked great. I went home and went about my week. Went to bed Wednesday night, feeling both of them move around my belly like I did every night. And I got up at 9:30 on Thursday morning. And I went to the doctor for a non-stress test where they put the monitors on their belly and they listened to their heartbeats. And they couldn't find a fourth heartbeat. And they looked and they looked and they moved it around because a lot of times it's hard to find them when there's more than one in there. And they got an ultrasound to find his position um, and there was no heartbeat. He had, he had passed away in the night. So there I was in the doctor's office again uh, by myself this time and um, hearing the worst news that I will, I hope, ever hear again, which is that my baby had died. Um, but by a miracle, Pierce was still alive. He was still alive. So they rushed me into an emergency C-section. And that was my boys 45 minutes later. And they whisked Pierce away to the NICU. Uh, and they wrapped Cohen up in a blanket, and they gave him to Sean. They held him by me, and um, took him to our recovery room, and we got to have him there as long as we wanted. We held him, and we loved him. Um, and then eventually we went home, with Pierce still in the NICU, and with no baby with us. Um, and this was some of the hardest times of my life, was to be alone, because Sean had to go out to work, um, was to be alone in my house with the baby, um, not with me ever, and the baby in the NICU that I was hoping to bring home. I had, a, and I had a friend at the time, Annie, she would come over and sit with me so I wouldn't have to be alone in her house. Um, we didn't always talk, she would sometimes just sit. But her presence was a gift, and um, one, of the, one of the places where I feel like God cared for me well. In that, um, but it really ushered in. Even when we brought Pierce home, finally four weeks later, we brought him home. Uh, it really ushered in some of the darkest um, times in my life. Really, um, grief. The grief was overwhelming. Sometimes pretty unbearable. And, and to be totally honest with you, um, sometimes it still is overwhelming. My um, son Pierce is almost five now, and uh, it still creeps up. The grief can still creep up. This week, um, my youngest son is eight months old and has been sick, and he's running a super high fever. Just a super high fever can automatically make me fearful that there will be more pain for me. So it's still here. It's still present for me. But in the beginning, it was uh, pretty unbearably overwhelming for me. Um, and I felt like everything that I knew about God and everything I knew about myself was just swirling. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know who he was. Um, I just couldn't find it. I couldn't find, um, I couldn't hear him, I couldn't see him. And I felt like everything that I believed about him uh, was coming undone. You know, tonight's theme is, uh, is anybody out there? And I think I actually uh, had, had a superior question, maybe, which is, because I believed he was out there, and I still believe all those things about his power and his majesty. But I thought, do you care about me, though? You're out there, but do you care? Are you involved? Do you love me? Um, because if I didn't see it, I couldn't feel comforted by him. Um, and anyway, and I remember I would sit on my couch and I would cry, just begging him to be so real that I would feel him physically sitting with me. And he wouldn't show up that way. So I was stuck, stuck in this place and unsure of the guy that I've known for, you know, 12 years, 10 years, um, that I've staked my whole life on knowing. And I thought he wouldn't show up. He wouldn't, he wouldn't come and be present for me. Um, and I was stuck there for a long time. I was sad. And uh, lost and uprooted and unsure of who God is. Um, and I would say, to be honest, uh, probably three years I was stuck there. Almost three years I was stuck there. And I feel like I started to experience what Ephesians talks about, but God. So you feel like you're at the end. There's nothing else for you to do. The story is pretty much over. That's where you're going to be. That's where you're going to be stuck. You're going to stay there. But it's just about God being rich in mercy. Corinthians says that at the right time, God does things. And I, he started to experience the but God, and I was, when I was stuck in his infinite wisdom, in his perfect timing, he started to kind of move some of the fog, clear some of the fog away from me. And in some ways slowly, in ways he's still doing now five years later, but in some ways really quickly, he started to show me, um, one, his nearness to me in my suffering, 
and his love for me, um, and also what he's actually doing in suffering. What is that he's, what is that he's producing and doing in our suffering? Um, and, I, and I think um, we miss it a lot. I think we miss seeing God and his nearness and his love for us because we are expecting him to show up in one way. We're asking him, we're asking one thing and we're demanding, really, if we're honest, we're kind of demanding that he show us himself in one way. We say, if you don't do this, thing, then you're not loving. Uh, if you don't give me that job, then you are not good and you don't love me. If you don't give me that husband, you are not good and you don't love me. If you don't give me that child, then you're not good and you don't love me. We can't see him any other way when we put that on him. We can't see any other way that he would be loving us. And I missed him. I missed him for a long time because I was looking for him and expecting him and demanding something from him one way, which was, one, take away the pain. I don't want to hurt anymore. But also, that's not loving to do either because Cohen's life is worth that. It's worth me uh, longing and pining for him and aching for him. And God, it would be cruel of God to, to erase that from me. So looking for him that way, I missed him. Um, and I missed many ways that he was actively pursuing loving me in my loss and in my suffering. And I was stuck uh, so long being angry at him for not showing up. For, yeah, I was literally would yell at him. Why, why would you just be so present that you sit on the couch? Like I asked you, why would you be so physically present? And then, but God, in his infinite timing, reminded me of Annie that I would be sleeping on my couch and I would wake up and she'd be sitting there, just next to me, not talking, just sitting there. But that's not, that's God's nearness to me. That's not an accident, that's not a coincidence, that's not Annie on her own showing up. That's her being compelled by God to love me the way I had asked him to, and his grace for me. Um, and I missed many of the ways, honestly, some of them are, are it's so embarrassing that I missed him on the side of it. It's, it's hard to tell you them. Um, but one of them is I was uh, very pregnant, and um, a good friend of ours in Seattle's daughter was having a minor surgery in the hospital, so I went to sit with her for the day so she wouldn't be anxious and alone. And while we were in the recovery room, uh, there was a, the doctors was on in the background on TV. It kind of caught our attention because um, there was a story about a family in Charlotte, actually, and ironically enough, the little girl's name that they were talking about was Kaylee. Um, she was a little baby. I don't know if you guys might remember the story. It was pretty public here. But she was, um, she was going to die. She was a little baby. She was going to die in the NICU. And that night, uh, in the hospital that day with, with my friend Jesse, I, I, I had an urgency about knowing what happens to babies. And I was like, I, got, I have to know this tonight. So I went home and I said, Sean, I gotta, I, we, gotta, we have to find out. And not just in theory, not just like, oh, God's loving, of course. But I gotta know what he says about, about how he feels about children and what, he, what happens when they die. I have to know that. And so we poured over scripture, which this is God's intervention because typically, you know, like six o'clock at night, Sean's like, yeah, we should study that like tomorrow or, you know, like maybe the week when I'm awake. Uh, but he said, yeah, let's look at that. And we studied scripture for hours. And we poured over sermons of pastors we trusted. And I emailed our theology department at church asking, what does God say about this? I have to know. And after hours of studying, went to bed that night really sure of what God says, what he feels about his children, what he does with babies. Um, and I woke up the next morning, and the next morning was my doctor's boy where I found out that Cohen had passed away. And that's God's nearness, that he would do that, that he would say, I want you to be reminded of how much I love you, how much I love your son. You have to be afraid of this tomorrow. And then later that day, I'm in the hospital room. I'm holding him. And we get to have, we get to have it with us. I'm holding him. His body, perfect, but he's not alive. And I'm looking at my email and have an email from our theology department at church telling me what God says about babies that aren't, they don't live here. And that's God's nearest. It's not, a, it's not a coincidence. That's God saying, I care for you and I care for your son. And I time this perfectly. And I would admit, I missed all of that for three years. I missed that he was actively loving me. I missed that he was actively pursuing me in the midst of my suffering. But that's another thing that he started to uncover for me. Um, like I said, somewhat slowly, but also somewhat in a moment. But he's doing something in our suffering. He's not, uh, he's not wasting it. He doesn't, he doesn't create us and not care about us anymore. He creates us, and he's intricately and actively still involved. And he doesn't let us... Um, he doesn't waste our suffering. He says, um, you're not just biding your time here. I didn't just create you so that you would uh, like, hold on, hold on till eternity, and things are better. He says, I, I want to draw you into me. I want you to have life. I want you to have joy. I want you to have hope. And all of those things are in him. And we get in our own way a lot. And sometimes, often, um, the longer I'm walking through my own suffering, the more I'm learning about God, the more scripture I'm reading, often the way he gets us out of our way is through suffering. 
And he does this by pruning away things. Suffering, I think, cuts away parts of us that don't, uh, are not life-giving, parts of us that are choking us out from our source, which is God, which is uh, Him. That he's our life, that He's our joy, He's our hope, and the things that we have in us that are keeping us from Him, that are steering us from Him, that are uh, keeping us in bondage away from Him. He cuts those things off. But it hurts. It really hurts to be pruned. Um, but every sense of longing and pain and ache that you have and anxiety you have is evidence of your design that it's supposed to be built, that it's supposed to be met. It's met in Him. And He will cut away anything that keeps us from trying to find it somewhere else. But it hurts. It really hurts. Um, I love how Elizabeth Elliot says this in her book, um, A Path Through Suffering. She says, no matter how thoroughly we understand its necessity, it comes hard to human flesh and blood. The, the, the pruning comes hard, even if we get why he's doing it, it still hurts. But she says, yet the hardness is softened. Believe me, it is. But we can concentrate on the truth the Lord has given us. This is the truth that he gives us. He says, Jesus is talking to his disciples in John 15, and he says, I'm going to prune you. You're going to be pruning. I'm going to cut away the things that are keeping you from life in me. I'm going to cut them, and it's going to hurt. But I want you to know I'm doing this so that your joy may be complete. He says, this is going to hurt. This suffering, this pain is going to hurt, but it's for your joy, it's for your hope, it's for finding life in me. Sometimes suffering is the most loving thing you can do, which is a paradox that is almost unknowable this side of eternity. But sometimes the suffering is loving because it gives us Him. Um, and what's left, what's left is life and hope and joy but it does hurt. And I want, here, here's the truth. Well, am I wounded because of my suffering? Yeah, like still now. And I think I will be until eternity. And was I lost? Was I confused? Uh, and was I unsure? Yes. But do you know what else was born out of that suffering? It was humility and hope and assurance of God and soft heartedness and grace and a new perspective and awareness of God's goodness and his love for me. And all those things were born out of suffering. They were born out of cutting away the things that were keeping me from seeing him and knowing him and gaining life in him. And one day I'm going to have a weight of glory due to because of the suffering. Due to the suffering, I'm going to have a weight of glory that I need to see and fall in eternity. And that's the same for you and your suffering. Um, God gives himself to us over and over and over. Um, and, and, though, and though suffering is painful, it's not only painful. It's also bringing life. And if ever you, if ever you forget this or this feels impossible to know or believe, you can look at the cross. You can look at Jesus. Because he was suffering. He suffered and he died. But you know what happened next is that the resurrection happened. So we live and we die impressed by the house of the resurrection. That he brought life out of his own death and his own suffering for you and for me to have life. And suffering is at the hands of a good God. And it's in the hands of a good and loving God. It's not uh, it's, it's not death, it's producing life. Um, so I want to close with this um, poem that a woman named Annie Johnston Flint wrote. And um, <coughs> this, is what, this is her take on pain <coughs> suffering. She's a woman very familiar with it. And as far as humanly speaking, she's had pretty much every card stacked against her in life. Um, she was orphaned as an infant, or maybe as a young child, maybe not as an infant. Um, her body was broken, weakened by cancer, deformed. She was embarrassed by incontinence. She couldn't get out of bed for most of her life. And this is what she has to say about who God is in the middle of that. And I'm just going to close this and, and leave it with you guys um, to encourage you and to just let it linger in your hearts. She says, He giveth more grace when the burden grows greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he added mercy. To multiply trials, he multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth. Amen.